Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 135, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Uh, we're not sounding very sprightly this week, I do apologise. <laughs> uh, we've survived Play London, basically. Oh my God, that weekend absolutely shattered us. Dan, you're now thinking of taking two days off after one of those events, aren't <laughs> Maybe you? Maybe two weeks next time. But what a weekend it was. Now, of course, we we have been talking about it on the show for the last couple of months. That we were at the, um, well, the first show that we've done in London, actually, isn't it? Play Expo London that happened. The weekend just gone on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, I think it's fair to say that was probably the biggest and the busiest event that we've ever done. Yeah, the crowds were absolutely huge. That whole place was rammed. It was like free different separate huge rooms that had loads of stuff going on and we did nine panels in two days i still can't quite believe we did that many yeah. <laughs> we had like we planned didn't we we looked at the schedule and we were gonna have like 15 minutes between them we thought that'll give us time to get people off maybe grab a coffee get the next person on but things run over yeah but everybody <laughs> wants to talk to the guests and stuff <laughs> yeah. and it just gets chaotic but what we've done guys is we have filmed all of it. So all of it's going to be released onto our YouTube channel, but also we're going to be releasing special episodes on the podcast. Well, we've got to give a shout to uh, Steve Fletcher from uh, Wavem Studios, who, of course, did uh, the Commodore Story documentary, who was down there all weekend filming our panels for us in beautiful quality. Oh, yeah, and we've taken sound directly off the board. So, you know, it's going to be the usual retro hour standard. <laughs> so we're going to be seeding those out probably in the next two weeks or so on uh, on YouTube. Uh, but today, we couldn't wait to get this panel out. Now, this this was actually the last panel that we did of the whole weekend. And this was Nightmare. Now, Nightmare's a TV show, isn't it? But it's well, it very, was. It, it was, but it's very like a, a computer game as well. Well, Nightmare, I mean, anyone that grew up in Britain in the late 80s and 90s who was into like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and adventure games and RPGs, Nightmare was kind of something that you watched alongside, you know, your games masters and your bad influence and that kind of thing. Ran for eight series from 1987 to 1994. And the thing about Nightmare is, after we did this panel, I've actually been watching loads of it on YouTube over the last few days. My fiance never seen Nightmare in her life. After watching that panel, she was like, should we watch some Nightmare tonight? I was like, yeah, <laughs> totally. I think it's like 112 episodes you need to catch up on now. But there are a few videos like, you know, the funniest nightmare deaths and stuff like that that are just hilarious. And it was kind of, you know, cross between a television show, an RPG and an adventure game as well. And also it kind of premiered like um, kind of blue screen effects and CGI, very early CGI too. Yeah, and it was very British because it had a lot of Shakespearean actors. So they'd, yep. be, they'd be talking in Shakespearean style. And, you know, they were a lot of them classically trained actors as well, which was really cool to see on this kids' TV show. And the one thing you'll find out about, you know, Nightmare when we do this interview is how much of it was all ad-libbed. You know, that very rarely planned anything, really. They might know a direction that they'd have to take the adventurer on, but obviously they don't know what the kids are going to say to them. So. And, you know... They had a lot of CGI in there. I remember they used Amiga 3000s for some of it, right? And there was a Quantel paint box, I think, was the main machine that they used for it. Um, I only know that because uh, there is a YouTuber called Retro Gamer VX, and he's actually got the the actual Quantel paint box that they used oh, on Nightmare cool. set up in his living room at the moment. So he's been doing restoration videos on that. So I'll link those in the show notes. But this week, uh, we're going to bring you the panel that we recorded all about this groundbreaking show that anyone who's a bit of a geek in the late 80s and 90s used to watch on TV in Britain. We've got Hugo Meyer, who played the Dungeon Master Treyguard. He was like the face of Nightmare, really. Uh, David Rowe, who did a lot of the hand-painted sets in the earlier episodes of Nightmare. And uh, Paul Flannery, who has brought Nightmare Nightmare back because it's also a live stage show now, isn't it? Yeah, so they're doing this kind of live nightmare experience. And, you know, it's cool because kids can come with their parents and kind of experience nightmare when you actually can't these days. And there was also a YouTube special of Nightmare recently as well that we talk about. Yeah, about four years ago. Ashens yeah. did it, didn't he? He was kind of behind it with uh, YouTube and their Geek Week. So, uh, yeah, all of that is coming up. If you love Nightmare back in the day, you were going to find this interview so interesting. It was the last one we that we did the whole weekend. I was a bit starstruck, if I'm honest, sitting next to Treyguard. Um, we we, we saved the best till last as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to run that on this week's show. That panel from Play Expo, the Nightmare panel, is coming up in around 15 minutes from now. But we talk about other panels that we did i think they were all such good standard over the weekend oh they were awesome really really good stuff and like i think the next week we should uh, run another because it was just fantastic um we had a great panel with andrew Hooson and rob yeah. Hooson, and it was like the dad and son kind of the dad telling all the old tales and the son talking about how he's coming back because we've had rob on the show about 
a year, two years ago when he was yeah. making the Hyper Sentinel game. But you're right, we actually did a proper panel with Andrew Houston talking about the founding of Houston Consultants and all that. So I think it will be interesting to run that one on the podcast, you know, next week, hopefully. And like we did the Digitizer panel, we did yeah. a YouTube panel that was massive. Yeah, the Oliver Twins announced that they were doing a new Dizzy for the Spectrum next. Another so one. <laughs> that's exciting. Archie yeah. McLean, we had him on. Hopefully going to run that in the next few weeks as well. Retro Gaming, the movie, that was a good one. Ant Stream. Uh, oh, there's so many over the weekend. So if you did come along, because we had that many listeners who actually came up, like all of the show. We were, like, literally rushed off our feet, so apologies if we did seem a little bit, you know, rushed. Oh, it was awesome, yeah, just having people come up and say, oh, we listen, it's like, we produce this, but we never see faces, so that was great. Makes the whole thing worthwhile, and we're going to be doing it again in a few months. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully this one will be a bit more of a chilled pace than London, because it's Blackpool and the drinks are cheap. (laughs) It's good fun. So that's coming up at the end of October, 27th and 28th. Play Expo Blackpool is going to be on now. Uh, I'm probably going to give the Saturday a miss, because unfortunately, I've got nothing planned for the rest of October. Apart from that day... It is Joe's wife's 30th birthday. They're having a party. It's my cousin's That's wedding. That's a Moana-themed party. I wanted to go to that, but I'm going to Blackpool. You were <laughs> yeah. uh, it's my cousin's wedding on the same day wow. as well. And Play Expo. Literally, I've got nothing else on for the rest of the Well, night. what we're thinking of doing is actually bringing in a friend of the show, DJ yeah. Slopes, to yeah. kind of do some stuff with us. And we are working on creating the panels at the moment. But, guys, we're going to have some fantastic ones there. And, you know, I love Blackpool because it's more of a community kind of vibe. Like... London's a big glam glitzy show and so is Manchester usually but Blackpool's got that cool vibe where you can all just hang out and dance to cheesy music or karaoke (laughs) and I'll try and make it over for the Sunday I'm sure so if you want to get tickets for that they are on sale now you can get them via our website or playexpoblackpool.com and we will see you there and uh, just before we get into the news stories this week we need to give a huge thank you to the people who allow us to keep doing the Retro Hour podcast week in week out because I still can't believe that we're like nearly at the end of August, and we'll be almost at this show's third anniversary soon. It's crazy. And you know, all you guys that help the show, you really help out with events like this. Uh, God, how many flyers did we have? (laughs) Tons of them. And we could bring them all across, and we had pop-up banners and stuff. So thank you so much if you're donating to the show. Honestly, it really does make such a massive difference because, you know, we were handing out flies to people that we got printed and looking at the banners and the like. People that may have watched us on YouTube but never seen the podcast before, which you still get amazingly. You know, totally. We've done it two and a half years. And also, we had an awful problem of completely messing up our recordings all the time. Now we've been able to get a recording device that's yep. solid and it means we can bring you all these shows for YouTube and the podcast. Yeah, and we keep getting people through the door, improve our hosting. We've got a new website that we're working on. So, uh, you know, and even hosting a podcast every week costs quite a lot in hosting services. So anything we get into the running of the show, guys, is massively appreciated. And of course, every penny that we get goes back into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. And you will find your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame just for making a donation. Like this week, Matthew Martin. S. Serger. Simon Rose. And Alan Purdom. And Wes Darley, who all made donations into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. And you can do the same. All you've got to do is head to our website. We have a cryptocurrency there for you into that or a PayPal button. Fill in your address in there, it'll convert any currency, and it will all go back into the running of the show and is massively appreciated. And you'll find that at theretrohour.com. Now, before we run our interview that we recorded with the Nightmare Panel, oh, so interesting. Hugo Meyer, Traegard, we are not worthy. Uh, I've got to put the selfie as well that we took with him on Facebook before this episode comes out. Maybe even as a show artwork, actually, because it was that cool. So before we get into that, though, there are some news stories that we'd like to talk about this week. Has been quite a busy week in the world of retro, and a game that I think we talked about on one of our earliest episodes, and we did have Matt on the show at some point as well. Tanglewood is finally here. Yes, Tanglewood's finally released, and we had a go on some early kind of press copies. And I broke it. And, and <laughs> Dan broke the physical copy ages ago, but this uh, this is not the version that we played. Um, we played a kind of pre-release version. So I've not played the main one, but I'm sure there's not any, much difference because it was only a few days between them. Now, Tanglewood is a full nude game that's been made for the Mega Drive, and this is majorly cool. It's been done with all Sega development hardware, and it's programmed in raw assembly. (laughs) Yeah, pure 68K, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. so it's really, really fast, and it's on Windows, Macs, and Linux as well. And uh, it also comes on a 16-bit real cartridge. So this is crazy. It's been getting, like, press all over the place. I've seen it in, like, 
Is it the Daily Star? I saw it in all the I knew big you, newspapers. I knew you were a da- Daily Star reader. I, I can tell by looking at you, Remy. <laughs> but um, it's been all over the place. and uh, I buy it for the articles, honestly. <laughs> but it has, you're right. I mean, the fact that having a new Sega Mega Drive game in 2018 is cool anyway, but having one to this standard... I mean, this raised like £55,000 on Kickstarter when it was on there. Well, how much were Mega Drive cards when you originally bought them? Oh, God, about 50 quid. Okay, so it's £54 for this release, yeah. which but is pretty mind, cool was on a car. Yeah, 50 quid in 1992 money, which is yeah. about 80 90 now, isn't it? Um, but and it's is... only 15 quid if you want to get it on Steam. Uh, but when you get it on Steam, you also get a ROM that you can put on a, net, a flash drive and play yeah, it on Mega so, Drive. Yeah, so you? that's the whole thing. Basically, if you get it on Steam, I played it on the PC, so instantly went into an emulator, uh, all pre-configured, loaded up, worked with my Xbox One remote. But yeah. you could download it, put the ROM onto an EverDrive or something like that, and then just go for it on your original hardware. Or you could get the actual physical Tanglewood cart with case and all of that. Now, the cool thing about this game is... When I played it before, it, the, the pace of it, it seemed like it was incomplete because it was a demo. The early now, version. The early yeah. version. Now, I played the latest version in it, and everything's paced correctly. So, you know, you wander around, and it reminds me a lot of Lion King, actually. You know, yeah. You, you, you well, wander, it's a platformer, isn't it? Yeah, you wander around, you find certain elements, but then suddenly, you know, the atmosphere changes, the pace increases, you've got to do puzzles, and suddenly the music comes on. So... I was actually finding myself getting a bit bored during the demo. This one, I found that the way that the levels are designed, the exploration, Mm. really captures your imagination and it keeps you going back and forth and you're like, oh, damn, I just missed that jump. And it was really exciting, you know. They have a kind of day and light effects in there. Yeah, that was a bit that impressed me most because at some point, I mean, you essentially play, does he specify what it is? It looks a bit like a little fox. Yeah, yeah, but it is a fox. Yeah, it's yeah. called Nim, isn't it? I um, think it's a vixen. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, it's running through the forest, and then it looks all like la 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 daisies everywhere. Then suddenly it's like Poof, nighttime, and like creatures come well, out. Well, that's the stuff. thing. Yeah, yeah, there's these whole dream sequences, yeah. and when it does it, there's different uh, cycles. So you're going into different parts. All the at one point the screen turns. Um, kind of a purpley orange and all this kind of colour and then another time it will be all bright and sunny and, yeah. you know <laughs> so it's it's really got atmosphere and the sound is really good on it as well like all the little sound effects they're really those kind of mega drivey like ooh hey you yeah, know yeah. It is a, a love letter to those early 90s platformers, but also, like you said, they're with concepts that you didn't really see back then. It's got a lot more depth to it, I think, than those old games. That's it, and it's not just one of these ones that's been developed on the PC, no. then chucked on something, or developed in kind of a easy program to do it on. It's, it's It's been done in the raw code. Like, I went to a lesson where Matt was teaching assembly, and I sat at the back and I just, I was lost in the first five <laughs> minutes. It was so advanced. So you put the disc in, right? I'd say I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it has been a game that I know the Mega Drive community have been really excited about for the last couple of years. And the fact that it is finally here, it's finally complete. And from the early reviews I've seen on YouTube, like today, it is getting a lot of love already. Yeah, I've only had time really because this was just before play to yeah. get to like level three. Mm. But that was awesome fun and I, I can't wait to explore it more. Absolutely. So if you want to get hold of that, we'll put a link in this week's show notes where you can buy it from on our website at theretrohour.com. Uh, one thing we won't be linking to is ROMs. <laughs> and that is what, what was technically termed abandonware ROMs. Well, well, last episode, actually, we were talking about Nintendo yeah. cracking down on emulators and we actually said, ah, oh, no, but ROM sites seem to be all right. And uh, about a day afterwards, Emu Paradise got taken down. <laughs> it was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So Emu Paradise, um, for those that may not know, uh, would, you, would you say that's probably the biggest ROM website? Or it uh, was? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, by far. It's, it's been running for 18 years. Yeah. And um, probably the best thing about Emu Paradise was a lot of all the other ROM sites on it, not that I'm experienced or anything, would have a lot of adverts that you'd have to click through yeah. to get to stuff. Emu Paradise would just offer you access, but they'd also host stuff like Homebrew and the cool Homebrew apps. Now, Nintendo have decided to start um, suing these ROM sites, which they've kind of left alone for a long time. Now, they were seeking £150,000 for each Nintendo game offered. Whoa. And uh, <laughs> these guys probably have, like, over 150000 or the entire collection. So 
uh, I think it's wiser that they take them all offline rather than face that legal action. But also, not only that, they're looking for also up to two million for each trademark infringement. So on top of the code, like Mario and stuff yeah. like that. That is a lot. <laughs> it's really crazy. And uh, I have lots of ROMs and I kind of keep them archived now. And uh, I think if you talk to people in the retro community, you could probably get hold of them. But there'll be a few on torrent sites and stuff. But I think they're really going to start disappearing offline. They're going to be a rarity yeah. that people are going to have full collections of stuff. Since these Raspberry Pi builds have been coming out with everything put on it and all the companies are starting to go, Oh, retro, retro, retro. We want to get involved with that. They're, they're going to start taking back all of the kind of stuff that they ignored before. Well, they've took down another one called their Love Roms as well. Nintendo is suing them. Um, another big ROM site. The thing about it is, it, why, why do you think now then, do you think it's because of like these kind of homebrew kits that are coming out and they want to get the market, I guess, with their mini consoles? Totally, yeah. That's it, 100%. They didn't care before. Yeah. And I think like... If they see stuff with a Raspberry Pi and then people downloading full images and then putting it into a custom Nintendo case and you've got every single game for every console on there, including PlayStation stuff and all of that, I think it's just... It's it's totally taking their kind of uh, stuff away, isn't it? Yeah, it's taking their business away, I guess, technically. But like I said, the, the annoying thing about it is, I mean, Emu Paradise... They've took up like pretty much all their stuff down now, I think. I guess there's still going to be a good good site for homebrew stuff. And I think, you know, maybe the community will thrive, like just ho- turn into homebrew communities rather than ROM communities. Well, well, off the back of that, I mean, Kotaku did a really interesting article um, that came out, well, today at the time recording this. It's called In Defense of ROMs, A Solution to Dying Games and Broken Copyright Laws. Now, what they're saying is... Um, like you said, you know, pretty much emulation websites and ROM websites have kind of been around as long as the internet has, really, haven't they? They've grown with the rise of the web, at least. I mean, I remember downloading, like, Commodore it, 64 ROMs. Well, even pre, pre-web, pre I remember yeah. getting, like, you know, emulators, like, on discs, and you'd have yeah. loads of different versions of them, and kind of, you'd get even ROMs on floppy disks at points as well. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, actually, I had Spectrum ROMs on an Amiga emulator, I remember that I got on a disc off a friend. But the thing is, like you said, people didn't really care for a long time. But then they're looking at, you know, what is the solution to this? I mean, the downside of it is there are games that people want to play that there is no other way to play them unless you've got the ROM. I mean, you know, you've got flashcards and stuff now. I can play games on my Mega Drive that I could never in a million years get hold of. These rare Japanese games that there might be like 20 copies of and they go for like 500 quid on eBay. It's it's weird because, like, I, I see it as kind of a Steam thing. Like, when Steam was around uh, early on, there was kind of a lot of need for piracy and people would be pirating all the games. But then as Steam got more popular and there was Humble Bundles and all these licensing and stuff, it kind of really reduced the price of games and then that meant more people were using it. So maybe stuff like Antstream coming around, maybe stuff like the mini consoles, that's all affecting it and they're seeing it as revenue. Well, I think you're right there. And this, this article on Kotaku actually kind of agrees with you. They make a, a good point. When was the last time you downloaded an MP3? Oh, God. I have enough. I've streamed yeah. music yeah. since then and totally ignored MP3 download. I don't have any music on my hard drive. Yeah. I think I only have a collection of old school garage <laughs> tunes. Yeah. That's it, really. Well, that's the thing. It's, they're saying that no one really downloads MP3s anymore because you've got Spotify and Apple Music and it's so easily accessible for an affordable price. So what they're saying is a kind of solution they put up here is, say, for example, Nintendo have took down that Love Roms website. Mm. They've actually got the domain off them now so Nintendo own it what they're probably going to do is put up like a finger wagging oh don't copy ROMs website but what if instead you went to Love ROMs and Nintendo put their games up there and you could play them in like a web interface or do what Dream 17 did and just know people were pirating and they love the games and just release them all yourselves like legitimate copies what about if they sell the ROMs for like a pound each well, that's what they want to do. Ultimately, yeah. they want to sell about 50 copies of the same game to all these different formats and systems. Well, that is a problem, though, isn't it? It's because I look at how many, like, how many times have I bought Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 on, like, the Xbox. And well, I, Shovel, Shovel Knight, I've got that on everything. Well, that's you know? the thing. Yeah. And these old games, I mean, if you want to, I mean, they're on Xbox Arcade and PSN, but then you've got to buy them on every different platform. You probably bought the same, like, game that you paid for originally back in 1992, about 10 times since. Yeah. But what you want is a ROM so you can play it anywhere. But that's also, that's also good for 
them because they don't have to do any work. They don't have to update it and people are still yeah. buying it 10 times. They're still getting all that revenue. So, But I think we, we, you look at this with, um, you know, the Amiga like Kickstart ROMs. They were like an essential bit to emulate the Amiga. And before you had to get Amiga Forever that cost about 25, 30 quid. Yeah. But then they put those up, didn't they, for like two pounds. Yeah. And now if I needed them, I'd just download them off that because it's only two quid. And I think of like, say, Nintendo and Sega have a website where you can buy all their back catalogue in ROM format for like one or two pounds each. I think people will do it. Yeah, I, I think I may implement some DRM into something yeah. like that, though. That's, that's it, the problem. That's when you go back on the torrent, though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right, so I think there does need to be something done there. There's got to be a solution there. Because if all these ROM websites vanish, I mean... Emu Paradise was great because it had like 3DO stuff on there and old DOS games. Yeah, that's the thing. Like a lot of these old games, they're mega expensive to buy online. And they had ISOs of a lot of the CD stuff. That's just, I'd never have a chance to play that originally. But you know, it won't be commercially available. But now, I don't know if they've taken all the ROMs off then or all Nintendo ROMs. They must have just totally done a full blank... I think the, the computer ones were still on earlier on this week, but all the consoles are gone. I can't see Commodore suing anyone or any of the older companies, but... It would be a shame if all ROM sites vanished because there's going to be a load of games that are lost to history. You know, in the future, it's going to be meeting someone in a back alley with a USB and they'll be like, <laughs> oh, do, do you want all of a NES? <laughs> or something like that. Or they'll start making uh, new versions of those cartridge copiers that you see on Bad Influence. Yeah. <laughs> X-Copy version 10 will come out or yeah. something. So. X-Copy XP. <laughs> just, just going back to like the early 90s again, aren't we? Now, before we get into this week's chat with the Nightmare panel, I love Tesla cars. I've always wanted a Tesla. You know, Teslas are cool as. Like, when I was in Amsterdam, um, they had this kind of thing where the government gave them cheap access to Teslas. Yeah. And I've never seen Tesla showrooms. I have. Yeah, and I was like, wow, they're awesome. And then in all the airport, they'd only let Teslas come into the main section, and it was so cool. One thing I don't like is they're too quiet. One appears behind you and you're like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> You've been run over before you realise. Yeah. <laughs> so why are we talking about Teslas on a retro gaming podcast? Oh, well, because there's the owner, Elon Musk. And uh, as, as we've covered before, he did a bit of retro gaming himself. Yeah, he, was, uh, he was a, made a few games, didn't he, back in the day? Yeah, he yeah. made a few kind of little arcade games. And actually, a lot of people don't know this, but um, he's been hiding Easter eggs inside the Teslas before. Right. So, um, (laughs) there's some references like more cowbell, which apparently means something, and more cowbell soon. Um, And you could send the console into hyperdrive, and the Model S uh, had 007 as the access code. Right, okay. That's very sci-fi. Yeah, so he's basically talking about, uh, it was a very small tweet, but it obviously gets people talking a lot. And uh, he has a bit of a connection with Atari. So he says, you know, some Atari games are going to be coming on the Tesla and released in a few weeks. Um, Thanks, Atari. How are they doing this then? So what, they're going to be putting Atari games in the Tesla? Yeah, so probably on the dashboard... Or, oh, I don't know, while she's driving, if you could get, like, Space Invaders on the front of your screen projected. Is it just me, or does that sound like an incredibly bad idea? Yeah. <laughs> like, have you heard about the self-driving in, in the Teslas as well? They've had this thing that they call autopilot. Yeah. And, uh, it's kind of like American cruise control, you know? It's not going to do the driving for you. Okay, it doesn't st- it's not like Google Cars, no, 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 but of course people have taken it too far and there have been guys that have actually climbed outside of their car, got onto the bonnet whilst it's driving on the, like, freeway and wow. took a selfie <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see how responsible people are with these Atari games. Not very by the sounds no. of their track record so far. At least you'll be able to hear a Tesla coming because it'll be pew, 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 pew <laughs> down the street. <laughs> Sound effects of Miss Pac-Man behind you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if these only work when it's stationary, that could be kind of cool. I guess if you can play that, you know, pole position maybe operated by the car steering. Yeah, wheel, yeah. You don't want to be playing effort. stunt car race whilst you're going around. Yeah, that could be an extraordinarily bad idea, but uh, yeah, it, it's cool anyway. I'll never be able to afford a Tesla in my lifetime, so uh, unless I see one at a showroom with it in and find out the access code. So if you want to find out more about those stories, we'll put them all in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Right then, Ravi, catch up on a bit of sleep now. Still getting over that weekend. Incredible. Um, We will have some of the pictures as well on our Facebook page because we did get quite a nice little collection. My most random moment, I think, of Play Expo over the weekend was um, we did get five minutes for me to run and grab a drink. I walked past and we had Alex and Joe, our two mates who were helping out with the podcast. I turned around and Alex was working on one of the retro gaming stalls. (laughs) Yeah, so they had this, the guy was basically like, oh, 
you guys look after my stall. I'll give you a free game so yeah. I can go and eat lunch. And then that deal kept happening. I don't yeah. know how many games they got from that, but they seemed pretty happy by the end. I think they got about six and a controller or something Joe was saying he got. Uh, and you know, Paul Weller was there. Yeah, I heard that. Paul Weller was there and he came in and he was just like, I love, Paul I, I love pinball machines. <laughs> just went on a big pinball session. So, I mean, I have to keep thinking of stuff like that. Did that really happen at the weekend? So, um, I just want to put this out there. If you did buy anything from what you think is the retro hour store and it didn't work, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with us. They were just our mates yeah, wearing we our don't do right? returns. <laughs> just put it out there. So, uh, yeah, if you want to find out everything that we did, of course, do follow us on social media. You can check back and uh, all the posts from the weekend are on there. At Retro Hour UK on Twitter. Instagram, our Facebook page. We'll link all of those and the rest of the stories that we've talked about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And now, recorded live at Play Expo in London over the weekend, talking about one of the most groundbreaking kids' TV shows of the late 80s and early 90s. Let's find out about Nightmare. Ooh, nasty. Please give a warm welcome to Hugo Meyer, David Rowe, and Paul Flannery. <laughs> welcome, strangers. <laughs> well, it would be good. I mean, you guys don't really need any, any introduction, I'm sure, but it would be good to uh, just get you guys to introduce yourselves and tell us your involvement in the world of Nightmare. I was in it for 113 episodes. <laughs> uh, yeah. How did I get in it? Very complicated. Um, new Tim Child, the, the brainy one who thought this up. He asked me one day to do a, 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 a pilot show for it, 15 minute pilot, wasn't going to go on the air. Just try and see if it worked. 100 quid in your hand, okay Hugo? Oh yeah, yeah. Three months later he phoned up again and said, um, we're going to do another pilot, won't go on the air. Um, 150 quid. All right, this could be a longer one, half hour. Yeah, right, terrific. Um, got me money, lovely. And that I thought would be the end of it. Uh, the rumour was they were going to find some name to front it and so on and so forth. Anyway, months later, I got a phone call from Tim saying, Oh, Hugo, uh, we've got a series. So I said, Well, congratulations. Well done, Tim. I, you know, best of luck with it. And he said, No, he said, We've got a series. You and I. And so that's how I got into it. But you, David, you had a background in graphics and video games before, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I was busy minding my own business as a freelance illustrator. And uh, I wasn't aware of anything to do with Anglia TV at the time. But Tim Child was uh, a TV reporter who wrote scripts. As the news came in, they'd be handed to the newscaster in front of the live audience. And, and that was his role. And he was aware of Chroma Key, the very early days where the, uh, the newscaster was in a blue studio and they would substitute the background. And it was also a telltale blue fringe all around where the technology was so crude. But he was a really enthusiastic adventure game player. So he would think, how do we actually get this graphically to look really good? And he came up with the idea. So there I was, minding my own business, delivering... Uh, an artwork, I think it was Shadow of the Beast 2, to Melbourne House. And the art director said, well, we've had a call from Anglia TV, someone at Anglia TV wants to speak to you. So I rang up and well, as quick as a flash, I was up there with my portfolio. And they liked the idea and they said, we've got no budget. Um, but I said, well, I've got to be paid something. So what I ended up doing was two um, dungeon paintings and acetate overlays to slightly change them. And I saw the pilot and it worked, so we went on from there. Well, you did um, video game artwork for some very famous games like Populous, Shadow of the Beast, like you said, James Pond 2, I believe you're involved in as well. Yep, Robocop. And, and I know then you had to, I mean, the graphics on the games weren't as good as the boxes, so you had to really attract the kids to want to buy that product, I imagine. Yeah, a video game cover's got one job to do, and that's for someone to pick it up, turn it over and read what it's about. So it it's, acts as a point of sale but also a point of reference because people play with their imagination. You've got eight different colored pixels dancing around the screen. You know, it's a lot more than that because it, it's, it's sold as a, a robot war game and you have to imagine that war. So I think the covers should be as explicit as possible. 
And Paul, you've brought back Nightmare for a new generation as Trey Guard in Nightmare Live. <laughs> I, I think I brought it back for the same generation. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. Were you a fan of the original show? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I very much like uh, most of my audience, I think. Around the sort of age you'd run home on Friday afternoon and watch Nightmare, terrified out of your mind, uh, and, and, and screaming at the TV, you know, go, go right, your other right. Just, uh, you know, all that sort of desperation. Um, and yeah, I was, I, was, uh, I was doing shows up at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, before I did Nightmare Live, doing like comedy shows uh, and doing sort of stand-up and, and sketch. Um, and then this sort of pub conversation came about, like, what would make a good, uh, what would make a good Edinburgh show? And we're like, well, Crystal Ways, the budget would be ridiculous. Oddly enough, I've worked at the Crystal Ways, now that's been made. Um, but so we were like, oh, Nightmare. And I was like, yeah, actually, that could, that could work. I could see it in my head working on stage. And then um, we sort of dug around the internet trying to find a, an email address for, for anyone, for someone who, had, who, was, you know, who was involved, like finding, trying to get hold of Tim Child. And I found this sort of really obscure email address. And I sent off um, this quite crude sort of pitch of what the stage show might look like, um, you know, a few sort of hand sketch drawings of things, uh, uh, sort of saying, could I please do this in Edinburgh? And we got back the most cryptic email I've ever received. It said, you have reached level one. <laughs> How would you like to proceed? So yeah, we sort of sent back, got, got chatting to him properly. Um, and his, I think his exact words were, well, you can't ruin it. Uh, <laughs> so he's very generously sort of giving me the live rights to go and take the show on. And that was five years ago. Um, it's nearly my job. <laughs> yeah, it's got weird. <laughs> Well, Hugo, were you into, like, Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy games before? Interesting question. No. <laughs> Knew nothing about it. I have to say that when, um, when Tim first suggested this, the very first pilot, he took me to a pub and he explained it all to me. Everything. And I said, yes, yes, of course. I understand. Yes, I see. I didn't understand a single word he was talking about. <laughs> but being an actor, you would say, yes, yes, I can, I can abseil, yes, I can ride, I can, you know, so that's how I got into it. <laughs> well, how did the character of Traegar develop then? Did you have a lot of input into that? Yeah, I suppose I did. Really. The, the, if you look at the early series, before we had a villain, as in Lord Fear, I actually had to supply the menace as well as the sort of a advice. So the, the poor things, I mean, one team said to me, they got so far and they went, help. And I said, no. I mean, I imagine the kids were probably quite nervous coming in there, were they? Um, well, they never saw us except on the set. And so when the Dungeoneer came through that portal or that archway, it's the first time they'd ever seen me. And some of them were absolutely shaking like this. But it didn't take them long to stop feeling like that. A couple of minutes and they were into the game and that was it, you know, tremendous. Well, talking of the set, David, um, the visual set was just absolutely fantastic. How did you get involved with that? Because it had a real unique look. So Tim thought this through really well. And uh, what he realized was in, in order to use a blue chroma key studio and paintings, that there had to be a common anchoring factor. So he employed the services of Jean Pierre, the French film ex uh, special effects expert, who devised a grid that would be exact from a 35 millimeter lens, 10 feet high, angle down 10 degrees, and that rostrum was not allowed to move at all because it would destroy the illusion. So I, I had to do all the room paintings based on that grid, and it was one meter square, so for example, a meter in from the back and the side was a two meter square footprint circular well I had to draw that, all the ellipses correct, and paint it so it looked like a proper well. And then the set designers would come in and make a blue donut circle a meter high, two meters square, so the dungeoneer could climb into that. But when it was composited, it looked like he was climbing into the well. And it was so well done that, in fact, they, they would um, not, they'd get rid of all the blue fringing, but they would burn a strong spotlight onto the character, which would preserve the shadow. So they had the shadow, and the first time ever that with chroma key, you ac actually anchored a figure to a painting. It, it just, it was groundbreaking. A lot of innovation. So was that like a big budget, or did you have to employ lots of tricks and stuff like that to get the good effect? Uh, well, I, I just sat down and drew it and painted it, 
I would send off colour roughs in the early days when I thought I had a lot of time. Um, I'd fax them, but towards the end, I'd managed to secure a lot of print work with British Telecom Soft, and game covers were coming in thick and fast. And I had Sally Freeman, the uh, producer, on the phone three weeks to the first show in tears saying she'd not got any rooms. <laughs> what am I going to do? I don't think I've got a show. Mm. So I set the alarm for 6 o'clock in the morning and worked to 2 a.m. every day for three weeks and turned them all over. It was, uh, but it's exhilarating, you know. It, you lived on raw adrenaline. Yeah. It was really en enjoyable. Well, Hugo, um, how was the show filmed? Was it like live to tape or were there many retakes? Or? No, no, no. Uh, a lot of people don't realise this. Though we recorded it, we really did it as though it were live. So there were no rehearsals. Well, there were camera re rehearsals, of course, but no rehearsals with the kids and no rehearsals with the, uh, the actors, really. And there were no retakes. So what you saw is what happened. Um, which in itself was quite alarming because we, before each show, we thought, now what are the kids going to do? And we worked out all these scenarios of what they could possibly do. They found another one, I'll tell you. <laughs> Every time they found another one. So we, we never quite knew what was going to happen. I imagine you had to improvise a lot then. Um, I didn't as much as the poor people in, in what we called The Void. Um, all the actors in the void actually didn't really have any lines. They were just given a scenario, i.e. we want to get the Dungeoneer in that direction, or to do that, or not to do that, or whatever. So they did it all by improvisation, and we had, in all, I think, 31 different actors and actresses, and as far as I recall, none of them ever screwed it up, which is quite incredible. The reason it's incredible is very easy to ad-lib and take someone off and you suddenly realize you've gone off on a tangent and how do you get it back? And that was the discipline they really had to get and they did it, they were brilliant. Well, the show did have a very high quality of actors, didn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know how he found them all because some of them were actually stunning. Some of them very funny. I mean, Mark Knight as Lord Fear was hysterically funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Other thing that, um, talking about ad living, what, what, I had to talk back from, from the director and um, every now and again, I get this wonderful thing when I couldn't see what the team were going to do or what they were up to. And I get this thing saying, Hugo, do something. You know, you can't answer back. Like what? You know, <laughs> and um, you see my eyes glaze over and I start talking very, very slowly. And I say things like, team, do you think that perhaps you ought to consider the other clue object on the table. Because <laughs> you did help the kids out though, didn't you? Yeah, a different, different time. If they were very small, young, I would help them more. Um, obviously, you know, you're interested in television values as well as, or production values as well as, a, um, a, you know, the, the game and the quest. We didn't want them to walk through the first door and blow it. <laughs> I mean, that would be a bit dull, wouldn't it? So you should try and help them a bit in the first scenes. Obviously, we wanted to get them into the game, get them as far as we could. Paul, did you have to do massive amounts of research on Hugo and kind of <laughs> study his character and pick up any of his, like, techniques? Uh, yeah, a bit. I mean, the whole show, we, we sort of worked from dot to try and recreate a live version of what was going on. And it, it was because we worked for sort of six months to a year before we'd even met. So we'd done, we'd done a version of the show before. We sort of like got together properly with... Um, I know, we had a, an initial meeting, didn't we, well, at one point? Yeah, that was after you squatted for six months with me and I didn't know who you were. <laughs> <laughs> I was in his cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, sort of taking all the improvisation sort of things of it and then going, oh, is he the good guy, is he the bad guy? Uh, and, and trying desperately to, to sort of arch the eyebrows in exactly the right... You know, mm. Sort of, yeah, a lot of standing in the mirror and going, ooh, team. Um, yeah, it was, it was an odd process. <laughs> it was like, to be fair, I, I sort of did, at the beginning, was um, making most of the stuff. So I built three of the helmets uh, and uh, we got the set made professionally, but I built a couple of the puppets um, and, and just basically had to learn how to use things like fiberglass. And uh, it just, yeah, it was, again, a bit like David, you end up going, okay, we've said we'll do this thing in three months. That's happening now, mm -hmm. whether it happens or not. So we better, work, and I just sort of worked every day for about three months 
for about like between sort of 12 and 15 hours a day building stuff making costumes organizing you know things rehearsing trying to write like an improvised show about a dungeon as well we didn't realize we, we did what you did in series one the whole thing was mapped out so if you go through door number one on the right you'll end up in this room if you go through door number two on the left you'll end up in this room it took about a month and a half before we figured out no one knows what's through that door we could just put anything can i can i butt in on that for a second this is absolutely true when i the first series we did it was exactly as, as Paul said. I had to learn a whole scenario for whichever door they went through. <laughs> and this is a sort of arithmetic progression. Because then there's another door or two doors. So that's two more things to learn. And it took them quite a time to twig. It didn't matter which damn door they went through. <laughs> we only needed one scenario. <laughs> and then you're sitting there going, caution team, choices. Are, uh, yeah. oh, your choice here will determine the rest of your fate. <laughs> it really doesn't. It's fine. Just get through the door. <laughs> I suppose technically Nightmare was quite a linear game. It was pretty much like start to finish. Um, but when you're watching it on TV, it didn't feel like that. It felt like anything could happen, though. No, at yeah. school, you're sitting there mapping it out, going, you're going, put, going through the tapes of last night and going, OK, they went through the third door in that room, uh, and that led them there. We shouldn't do that. If we get on, you take the bread and the spanner, and you go through door number two, and you know, you're going, oh, map it out. <laughs> right, we've got to get on Nightmare, guys. I've got the formula. I've got it sorted. <laughs> <laughs> No way. <laughs> but when the child was wearing the helmet, they could just see below them. All they could see was a, a, a circle of blue. Some of them used to cheat and try and lift the helmet up there. Like They'd still just see blue. There was nothing else there, you know. So I always imagined as a kid that it was filmed in like a massive warehouse, but how yeah. did you stop them walking into walls and ah, things? Now there's a story about that one. We had a very, very uh, far back team of girls, really nice, very, very well spoken girls. and. Uh, and they put one of these lovely girls under the helmet, you see. And she was a bit of a strider. And they said, walk forward. And she went straight across, bang into the back wall. Whereupon she let, let out an expletive I wouldn't have thought she would have known, <laughs> let alone used. And that's the only time I can remember somebody shouting, cut! <laughs> That's not what she shouted, no? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Cut. Okay, okay good. That was a three-letter word and not a... Not good a stuff. Yeah. Well, David, you kind of... They introduced more CGI later on in the show. Did you think that kind of lost something, the show, or, or it added to it? Yeah, it lost me. <laughs> Did it spoil the charm a bit, though, do you think, of the look? No, I, I'd done, I think, about 48 dungeon rooms. I was pretty well dungeoned out. I, but, they, but they were using sections in the CGI mm -hmm. later. I did. I, I have to say, I did feel it lost a bit of the magic because I think David created the magic with the look of the thing, and uh, although it, you know it developed in other ways, I I always felt we just lost a bit of that original magic when David's uh, Thank you. stuff went. That's all right, David. You know that's how I feel. <laughs> that's why they've never had me back. So uh, where did the catchphrase uh, "all nasty" come from? <laughs> Well, it, it wasn't intended to be a catchphrase, but very early on we had various ways of getting rid of the kids. <laughs> and, and one was the, to drop them from an enormous height, where we had an animation of this sort of child falling. Actually upset Mary Whitehouse a lot, this did. Um, we got letters saying that I was this nasty old man trying to kill off children and things. Anyway, but the trouble is, this animation took a bit of time, you see, and nothing was happening. So when I first went in, I went, Oh, nasty, to cover the fall. And the classic <laughs> wince. Yes. Oh, There's always those corridor scenes with the blades flying ah, down. Now, this, this, is, this, is, this is quite interesting. We called that Gatwick uh, because of the moving walkway at the Gatwick Airport. But the thing about it was um, they would put it in if they thought things were slowing down or getting a bit dreary. And I'd suddenly hear, Hugo, we're putting in Gatwick. <laughs> And the poor kids. The great thing about it was it made them jump about, you see. It made them be physical. They just, or at least the dungeoneer had to start jumping and they were shouting, down, left, right, up, whatever, you know. The thing is, we never actually sliced anybody's head off. You know, I thought we could have some nice blood and things, but no, we didn't. We didn't manage to slice anybody up. So it was a good trick, though. The life forces all seemed a bit kind of random. Was that a technique that was employed for some reason? It was just, that was just a way of, of keeping the thing speed it up, keeping time, keeping pace on it, you know, because it's like I say about the bomb room. It used to drive me mad, this wonderful bomb room. So where are we? We're in a room. What? Describe the room. 
Uh, well, there's a large bomb, <laughs> and there's a fuse, and yes, the fuse probably nothing, probably is nothing a to worry light. About. <laughs> Uh, what do we do? Oh, what do we do? Do we go? Do, what do you think we should do? What, I think, it's obvious. Run like hell. Get out of it. But you know, they wouldn't. And so in the end, we had to find a way of slowing the fuse down to give them time to find a way out of this thing. We never blew up anybody, by the way. I, I was asked to do a second bomb room, and it had a much shorter, faster fuse. Mm. And if a team was really no good, it was the second bomb room <laughs> for you. <laughs> Paul, you play Tregard in Nightmare Live. I do. Um, what's the concept of the show? What's it about? Well, Nightmare Live is, is the sort of recreation of, of Nightmare. And it, it, we try and sort of... It, it's a sort of... It's a sort of friendly, lovely pastiche to it. It's never... It, it, there's always a good sense of fun about it. Uh, and in a sort of fond remembrance of the TV show without ever, you know, sort of taking... Uh, taking the mick really because there are certain aspects of it like you know you, the bomb room thing if you if you sort of peel under the surface it doesn't really sort of hold up you know was Trey God happy that they died or no. unhappy that they died why why is their face falling off why does fruit prevent this <laughs> you know if you if you so we sort of delve into a few of the added questions which is quite fun but but ultimately it's sort of a, a lovely excuse for um for people who used to watch the tv show to come and unleash a load of catharsis at the stage because the, you know, the goblin horn will sound and you'll be transported back to your childhoods and everyone will scream, the person in the hat won't be able to hear anything, they'll probably die, uh, and it, great, we go, ooh, nasty. <laughs> and yeah, and you feel like this is com you know, completion. Um, but what's really nice now is everyone's starting to bring their kids. Uh, so the kids are having a great time. Um, you know, yeah, have you brought your, brought your kid? Yeah, yeah lovely stuff. Because yeah, what, what kid doesn't love an adventure and a quest? Uh, occasionally we get kids up on stage and stick them in the hat and it's it's amazing they're they're intuitive they uh, i got one kid up who's like 15 once in norwich um, and he came off stage afterwards and goes wow that was better than watching it wasn't it ah <laughs> oh, that oh, i had so much fun you go, this is brilliant you were talking to a big wall puppet and they just they just buy into it and um, i tell you what we got we got up two kids once because i got this this young boy and um, his little sister was sitting next to him, and I thought, God, if I get him up, she looks distraught. So I got them both up, and so he wore the hat, and she sort of stood next to him, cowering behind the eye shield. It was the cutest thing you've ever seen. And so our Lord Fear is going, I can't kill that. That is... I mean, I've got some morals. <laughs> so, but it's, yeah, it's, it's borderline pantomime. Well, <laughs> what made Hugo so good uh, that you wanted to kind of follow his character and uh, continue it in Nightmare Live. It's just one of those iconic characters from, from, from that era of television. You can't, um, I don't, you know, the only hope is that I sort of do it justice. Uh, and uh, this sort of lovely relationship between him and Lord Fear uh, can come into play. And so we bring back some of the other characters and you sort of play around with the convention of who owns this castle? Who owns the dungeon? You know, do they work together? Is there a joint lease? Have they? There's a lot of admin uh, involved in it, and they're kind of there's a kind of odd couple relationship between Chagall and Lord Fear. But the, it's yeah, I I've always it, from my childhood, it's generally like one of my favourite ever TV shows, mm. and so to be able to sort of replicate that is a is an immense honour, uh, and to sort of embody, you know, Tra I mean, look at me covered in studs. <laughs> Oh, here you go. Tregard did get a sidekick with the elf pickle yes. in a series four. Can, can I just say about that? I'm often wonder if uh, Lord Fear and, and Tregard are actually one and the same person. It's a sort of Jekyll and Hyde character. Well, that's <laughs> the plot for next year, sorted out. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Pickle was brought into the show, I mean, did, did that help having someone to bounce off? Uh, it was, yes, it was more being able to comment on the action. It's very difficult to comment on the action by yourself. And so that was the plan with, with getting Pickle in. Um, I don't think we did that much commenting, but sometimes we did have to say something like, I don't know what the hell they're doing, team, or something. <laughs> so it was quite handy that way, yeah. Yeah, it was like we've described Pickle as the, um, it's not the Microsoft Word paperclip of the show. Oh, it looks like you're on a quest. Yes. Would you like some help? <laughs> If something funny was going on on set, was it hard to stay in character and <laughs> you um, know, keep composure? Uh, to be honest, not for me. I'm so stoical, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, never, I never corpse or gig, gig, giggle. <coughs> no. Um, I, I think, to be honest, I was too concerned about what was coming next. 
as I say, with the girl who hit the back wall, I suspect I did allow myself a brief smile. But <laughs> I was supposed to be stern, so I didn't. <laughs> um, the, I just think it was, everybody was under tremendous pressure. We loved it, but it was, you know, full of adrenaline. The thing, if you think of those poor guys actually in the void, trying to improvise with these kids, and sometimes they weren't the slightest bit helpful, and you're trying to get them to say something or do something or choose something or whatever and they're just being totally dim, that is very difficult. So, yeah, I think everybody was sort of hyped up quite a lot. Recently, in uh, 2013, they did a Geek Week special. Mm. Uh, what did all you guys think of that? Well, it was very strange. Um, Tim uh, phoned me up and said, um, who was it? Um, YouTube, that's right. They said um, they want to do a, a show, a nightmare show. I said, really? Yes. Were you interested? I said, yes, we'll do it. Uh, it was very odd and very deja vu because I was in the same dressing room, in the same studio, in the same costume as I had been 25 years previously. It was a bit surreal. Because it was filmed in the same place. Yeah, exactly the same place. And um, we had these, um, pardon my ignorance, I expect all of you know this, but they were used YouTube stars. Now, I don't actually know what a YouTube star is and I'm sure they're wonderful people they were very nice people but they were the worst games players I think we ever had <laughs> yeah they, they, were, they didn't quite they quite were terrible click, they? Yeah. believe it or not they managed to um, blow themselves out at exactly the right number of minutes for us to have made a program and everybody all thought we'd fixed it but we hadn't they really did that it was though they timed it to a T you know but they weren't very exciting to, as game players. Very nice people. Had they planned more of the episode then in, in case they went online? Who knows? I, know, I don't know why we did it, how we did it, or anything else. We did it, and that was the last I heard of it. So I have no idea what it was about. Well, that was a great day. I, I was there on that day. Uh, we got a lovely invite to the studio in Norwich. Tim was like, come up. Also, bring your helmet. We need a helmet. Yeah. <laughs> so that the helmet they use on the, on the one is one I made. Uh, which I can tell you had a very strange odour inside uh, and had real cow horns. It was really heavy. I had this stupid idea of thinking, real cow horns, come on, you know, authenticity. Um, so, yeah, me, uh, me and Tom were at the studio that day having a lovely time. So, you know, running around into the blue screen box, like, ah, big pictures. Um, when I got drunk with you guys afterwards, that was great fun. And then Tim Child gave us a bunch of props at the end. And we thought, what a generous, generous man. Uh, forgive us, the, 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 the actual chest from Nightmare, a couple of shields, um, some prop swords, uh, and all he was really doing was clearing out his shed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just don't, I, I've had it for 25 years, I really don't need it anymore. <laughs> well, Hugo, was it hard to kind of find the character of Treyguard again after so long, or did it come straight back to you? It came straight back in, <laughs> I can assure you. No trouble at all. <laughs> well, why did Nightmare finish on TV, and were you upset when it did end? Well, I just said, um, join us again for Nightmare. And then they axed it, yeah, so I was pretty upset. <laughs> I think we had two years more worth of stuff that we could have done. Um, I've had all sorts of reasons given to me why it was axed, but I think the truth is that Nightmare cost, I was told, about a third as much as a drama to make. And if you think back to that particular period, that's when this huge number of channels suddenly emerged. And, of course, advertising revenue didn't grow by that amount, so it had to be spread amongst all these channels. It was just too expensive. Nobody would make it today. Five bobs worth of um, cartoon will do. Stick it in. Give the kids that. That's what happened. Well, we're going to give uh, the audience a chance to ask some questions now. So if you'd like to ask uh, any questions about our panel, just raise your hand. Ravi will run over with a microphone. Uh, speaking as someone who's uh, an actor himself, how did you find making that transition from doing um, something with kind of like scripted to something like Nightmare, which you had to do a bit of improv with? Well, I think the short answer is frightening. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you, uh, in a play, of course, um, you learn the lines, and if you don't, you're the one who looks a complete fool. But in this, uh, although a lot of what I did was sort of scripted, it was, the, it was the, the voice from the gods in my ear that was the terrifying thing. And sometimes they'd change a scenario totally and they gave it to me word for word. So I was getting 
the, the riddles, if you like, through my earpiece and relaying them to the, to the children because they decided to do something quite different. So that was quite hairy because I haven't got the best hearing. I've got even worse now, but I, was, I hoped I said the right thing. <laughs> you know? I've got another question here. Uh, hello. Uh, I just wanted to know um, if Nightmare continued, um, what three ideas would you have liked to have seen in that series if it continued? Any of you guys? Larger salary? <laughs> no, um, More I, spikes. I don't. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to see it. Uh, the return to the original painted backdrops. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think. Um, what Tim would have done if he'd had the technology would have pushed it to the limit like he did in the first place. Yeah. And um, I've got a couple of friends who are software developers and what we've done, and we're aiming to get onto a, your smart TV, a 3D environment, beautifully lit, full radiosity, full 3D, that you can view through three of uh, um, VR, but also we've managed to harness voice control so a group can be sitting, watching their smart TV, looking at the avatar on the screen, holding up a torch in a dingy old room, and then tell him to walk forward or step left or step onto a particular part of the floor, which will trigger all sorts of exciting actions. I think that's the way I'd like to see it go, and I think it's got huge potential, um, both for all those people who wanted to be on the show and couldn't get on, they can now sit on a sofa with friends, discuss what move to do next, and proceed through the dungeon that way in their living room. So I remember in the early 2000s, there was an attempt to do like a VR kind of nightmare, wasn't there, mm. an animated series? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Tim, I think, always wanted to get rid of the helmet, which I always thought was a mistake. It's what made it. And as I say, you know, um, watching um, virtual reality ads on television, there's grandmother enjoying herself and all the family around going, yes, yes, whereas in fact they'd be saying, give it to me, it's my go. You know, it's not much fun watching someone else enjoy themselves, is it? So you want to be involved with the thing. That's, that's the problem, I think. You've got Why it works so well is because, I always say, the, the advisors were shouting at the dungeoneer and people at home were shouting at the advisors. Yeah. You've got two levels of drama there. Hello. Um, I've actually done Nightmare Live. It's an amazing show, so do go and do it. Um, my question is to the two trade gods. What has been your favourite deaths? I'm, <laughs> I'm nasty like that. Favourite deaths? Oh, yeah. We did a, we did a, a, a version of the show where, to, to spice things up, we had an insta-kill in the first room. Because, uh, you know... Because well, the, the first time we did the show, uh, we, we, couldn't fi we couldn't figure out a way of how could we kill people off and start them again? Because we'd have to brief people what it's like to be in the hat. And after a while, you go, actually, you don't, you don't really need to do that. Everyone who's up for being under the helmet will get the idea. So um, we, we started to, to, to sort of welcome in the change. It'd be the first room, there'd be an anagram, and then a Fright Night would turn up and poof, dead. And you just go, what is room one? <laughs> And you're like, yeah, got to get on your toes. And you're like, oh, okay. And it just put everybody on edge. And it was, yeah, it was really good, good fun. Every now and again, we bring that back because fun, fun to kill. I shouldn't say that. That sounds like the bad guy. But I don't really have one. I mean, I, yeah, it's an awful thing to say, but I, I don't. I just loved it all. So uh, the things that amused me perhaps weren't the best bits. I mean, I remember we had one team that had to, a team of boys, quite boisterous lads had to stay overnight in a hotel because um, their game, you know, we had finished for the day and gone the next day. And they turned up the next day and one of the boys had a wonderful black eye. They'd had a falling out during the night and they'd walloped this poor kid. And um, there he was. So makeup took about three hours to sort of camouflage this black eye so we could actually go on filming. Well, I th I, it amused me. I shouldn't have been amused, but it, it did. I think. That would have done some explaining in the, in the show, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm. I've got the, the other one. ones I like are the pathetic. Where someone fails to pick up a banana and mm. that dead. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, you, it's so good at this bit with the live when we have the banana on the chest and people walk up and they knock the banana onto the floor in front of the chest and their face is falling off. And you know there's no way they're going to get around to it. And I go, you failed to put fruit in a bag. <laughs> and ergo, that's how you went. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, I just wondered how many people 
completed the quest on TV and how many people complete the quest on Nightmare Live and then what the prizes are or what the prizes were for each. Do you know the ones for TV? How many people oh, won? How many people won, so to speak? There were eight in all in eight series. That didn't mean there was one a series. Sometimes we had two a series, sometimes none, etc., etc. What they got uh, was absolutely <coughs> all at the beginning. <laughs> I think followed by a scroll, which wasn't terribly dramatic, but at least it was democratic. They all got one. The worst thing was a very nice statuette made in steel called a Fright Night. They thought this is great. The winners could have one of these. Can you imagine giving one Fright Night to a team of four <laughs> who all lived in different houses with different families? I mean, it was disastrous. I'm having it. No, it's mine. You're having it. You know. Well, you can have it for a week. No, I want it for a month. No, oh dear. One of, one of them came to, came to a Nightmare Live show with his Fright Night trophy. Uh, we, yeah, it's got, I got the trophy. Not got friends, but got a trophy. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm elaborating, I don't know. Um, for Nightmare Live, we, we essentially, because it has to run uh, for an hour and you have to have the sense of completion, there always has to be sort of like, um, we used to have it so that we sort of fudge it up until the last room that you'd stay alive. Now we sort of kill people off and we just swap people in and out and then you continue the quest from where the person left off and you get to the end and it's basically the last room you have is the 50-50. We usually have the room of blades or the block and tackle room and if you survive that, you've won the quest and if you don't, you haven't. Um, and the prizes have always been very, very minimal, uh, like badges. Um, we're doing scrolls now because that was what they did on the TV shows, trying to keep sort of as authentic as I can. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things. If you've, have you seen the French version? Chevalier de Labyrinth. Oh, it's nightmare, but it's not really nightmare. <laughs> There's a guy in this red velvet doublet with like a, a mullet. He's so French! Oh, Chevalier! It's incredible. Uh, and the kids go through and it's done in one episode instead of over several. So if one kid dies, they swap him in with the other team and they have to the length of the episode to win, you know, to get to the end. And if they do, they get a Sega Mega Drive! <laughs> I know! No, it's not the way. All right? It's not Funhouse. Not here to give people boxes of prizes. It's about learning life lessons. Yes. <laughs> I've got another question here. <laughs> I've just got one question that was based on all the arguments that we had had as kids. From me, all three of you, would you rather have been the person in the helmet or the one in the studio watching the action? Oh, I mean, the brightest kids always wanted to be under the helmet, which is where we least wanted them to be. We wanted them to be with the advisors. Because, and apart from anything else, what has mum got to look at when he comes on the television? <laughs> Nothing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was very sad. We could never persuade them. We always said, no, no, you'd be much better as a visor. No, I'm going under the helmet. I'm going under the helmet. And, and they did. And, of course, all they got was do this, do that, sidestep left, whatever. They didn't really contribute that much to the thing. So, yeah, be an advisor every time. You don't get chopped up. And it doesn't really matter if you make mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, advisor. I think I can see the joy of being in the hat. Um, sorry, so in the under the helmet of justice I, is my short phrase. In the hat, because um, you get to talk to the other characters, and sometimes you know it's great fun to improvise, and you can you can sort of sneak your way around a person. There was there was one shopkeeper in the original TV show from Birmingham who was sort of like not the kids going. What if I what if I gave you some uh, some fairy dust? And he was like, no. No, and his kid's just like, his kid's brain's going, I've got all sorts of stuff I can give this guy. <laughs> I'm offering him everything. And this guy's going, no, I just need the prop that's in your hand. I just... <laughs> so it's a shame to have some... But yeah, under the hat, you can, you can really use your imagination and go, come on, deal with me. <laughs> I've got another question here. I think, just can, can I just say, the, the, the real complaint that I think was quite valid uh, from some people in the press was that we did teach children to bribe <laughs> uh, hi there. Uh, thank you, first of all, for childhood memories and recreating childhood memories and for letting someone fall off the stage yesterday. Sorry, um, that didn't happen. <laughs> okay, no public liability. I didn't get that. Um, just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned oh, yeah. the YouTube channel earlier. Has the idea been pitched for Nightmare, maybe with Nightmare Live editions? to ITV or Al Dave for a celebrity type thing? Almost constantly for about four years. 
Uh, it, but the, the wheels of t television move very, very slowly. Um, there's been sort of several meetings and iterations and talks and pitches to several different channels with different people and companies taking up the reins and then letting them go again. Uh, the sad fact is television is a very fickle business, especially nowadays. What's weird is that obviously things have come back. You know, Crystal Maze has come back and is doing really well. Uh, Robot Wars has come back and has done re reasonably well. Although they seem to think the, the key to doing things is putting Dara O'Brien on the front of them. We which is odd, I love Dara Bean, he's great. But I watch Robot Wars for two words. Robot Wars. Mm. All right, if you're not interested, that's enough, isn't it? To watch a TV show. Um, so we'd love to, start, I, I mean, I'd love to see Nightmare come back on television. It'd be awful if Jack Whitehall was Trey Guard or something. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? You're getting some awful bearded comedian who people know, get me, get me back. Yeah, so yes, but no, but yes. Um, quite interesting to, to uh, note that, in fact, Tim had a hell of a job trying to sell this the first time round. He went to all the television companies and they all hummed and hard and nobody would actually do it. And when he got back to Anglia, where he worked, and they said, well, you know, what about you doing it? And they said, no, no, no. Except, and they said, except if you became independent, i.e. they were telling him to give up his job at Anglia and become an independent producer so that it wasn't their responsibility then they'd give him some backing which is an amazing sacrifice he made and taking an amazing risk but he did it and so all, all kudos to him because um, he chucked up his career as a journalist in television and risked it all on this program so i think that was absolutely stunning I think it is testament to how incredible Nightmare was, you know, 30 years ago. The fact that if you see it on, like, Challenge TV or YouTube now, the shows are still as enjoyable now as they were yeah. all that time ago. So I think yeah. it is testament to the great work that you did and you continue to do now. And um, he was so handsome, too. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people see Nightmare Live next? Uh, Nightmare Live, oddly, is sort of a summer gig. I'm, I'm trying to get another show together in London. There's some guys who, uh, what are they, pre prepare to try... Is everyone aware of those guys? No? No. They're, they're some YouTubers as well. They, they run a Twitch thing, but they're really keen on doing a show in London, so I'm going to try and get another one out uh, before the end of the year. Um, you can find Nightmare Live on Facebook and on Twitter at Nightmare Live. We have a website. So we, we're sort of constantly trying to do shows at various places around the UK. We do go on odd bits and tours, but mostly it's, it's, we're doing conventions and things nowadays. Uh, do board game conventions and, and, and nerdy conventions. So, uh, so yeah, come and find us on that and hopefully, hopefully you'll come and see us again. That'll be great. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your memories. And please give a big thank you to our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.